Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, welcome for the people here uh, on site and welcome to the people watching from home because as some of you know this is live streamed as well. Um, welcome at this NIAS Talk Harvesting Care. My name is Zara Kars. I will be today's moderator um, and I am a program maker at NIAS Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study who is also the organizer uh, of this talk. Um, this talk marks the beginning of a new season of NIAS talks uh, and I'm very happy to introduce in a minute our speakers for today. Uh, but first let me tell you a little bit about what NIAS is because I can imagine that some of you are not exactly aware of what this institute is. So NIAS, the Netherlands Institute for Advanced Study, is a intellectual haven, some call it, for scholars, artists, writers, working on interdisciplinary and curiosity-driven research projects within the arts, humanities and social sciences. And each year we are very happy to welcome between 30 and 50 people who work on their research and we invite those people to talk in these NIAS talks uh, with you, the audience, and with other journalists, writers, scholars, uh, artists. Um, so that's short about NIAS. Then today's talk. We are going to explore uh, what city gardens or urban farming and anything in between, uh, mean to our food provisioning and our, our ideas about care, sustainability, both for uh, humans and nature. Um, because I don't know if you've noticed, but the summer was hotter than ever. Uh, there were farmers' protests everywhere and uh, there were huge fi fi fire forests as well. And um, I think this presses us to rethink our ideas about ecological resilience, but also what we as people uh, have to do to maybe reimagine our food system, our ways of dealing with nature. Um, so today we are going to do so, or at least give it a try. Um, and uh, I will introduce our speakers, uh, Kate Brown, who is a fellow at NIAS, Esther Veen, uh, Ruben Jacobs, and Anna Koy. Um, I will introduce them more thoroughly when they are here on stage, because it might be nice to have a face with names. Um, so I think let's get started. Kate, can I invite you on stage? And also Esther, um, take a seat. Now, I hope this microphone works as well. Yes, nice. Um, our speakers, our first speakers today, Kate Brown is an environmental historian, a professor of science, technology, and society at the Massachusetts Institute for Technology, often known as MIT. And she um, has interests within both history, science, technology, biopolitics, what not. Um, and from September till January, she will be a fellow at NIAS, where, and here we come to today's uh, um, topic as well, she will be working on a book on self-provisioning in urban little gardens. Um, Esther, here next to me, is lecturer at Ayres University of Applied Sciences in Almere. And she is lecturer of Stedelijke Voedselvraagstukken, which I think translates into urban food issues. Uh, I translate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and she's specialized in food in urban areas and social cohesion in city gardens, amongst others. Um, and currently, she's working closely with the Flevo Campus, um, where her research focuses on food habits and healthy dieting and farming and the whole bunch. Um, Esther, maybe to start with, to... You want me to take that? Yes. 
to immediately, immediately take some unclarity out of what we talk about today. Um, we're talking about care, we're talking about farming, we're talking about city gardens. Um, how do they differ or what do you think we need to maybe uh, yeah, well, differentiate? I think, um, is it okay like this? Yeah. Um, I think there is um, some difficulty or I don't know, uh, confusion maybe about the term farming or urban farming and also about the term care, but we also talked about just before. So there's on the one hand, there's these multifunctional farms in the countryside that also offer care to various groups of people, um, sometimes the elderly, sometimes youth or anyone who is in need of receiving specific care, they go to these so-called care farms. Um, but of course, we can also talk about inner city projects where people get together to garden a smaller piece of land um, that may be some kind of official, formal, institutionalized care. But we can, um, we can also even talk about, I don't know, different ways in which working in green cares for us, or we talked about it just before, we care for the green environment. So then it's not necessarily an official, yeah, I don't know whatever that means, but an official type of care. Um, yeah, so we should define both care and farming when we talk about these topics, or to know what we're talking about. Thanks. Yeah, okay, good. So I thought maybe this is good to start with, because I can imagine that some of you in the audience also have questions on what are we talking about exactly? Um, and during our sort of pre-conversation, we noticed that we had some unclarity as well. Um, so thanks, I, I think yeah. that might help yeah, the conversation. Yeah. Um, Kate, I was wondering, you're working on this book on the history of self-provisioning, but you've been working before on more uh, other topics, right? More wastelands, Chernobyl kind of situations. How, um, <laughs> I mean, it's completely different. How uh, did you come across this topic of self-provisioning little gardens? Uh, well, I guess I um, had the sense, you know, after I worked on these histories about, um, you know, the creation of big disastrous mountainous wasteland that um, that doesn't really, I mean, we read about them, we become rightfully upset and depressed, but then what? What, what can we do? What can we do about the, the, the state of nuclear affairs? Where I think on a, on, a, on a level that's more human, on a level that's right here, um, we can do a great deal simply by growing our own food, by liberating green spaces right here in our midst. And what I realized, you know, I was um, you know, just reading like historians do, and I realized that there were, as the, as the cities began to grow in the 19th century, you know, from small places, you know, like Berlin to big, you know, mega cities like Berlin became, or New York, um, Paris, working class people started to take the resources that people hoard and bring to cities, um, and they started to, and, and then treat as garbage, like food scraps and uh, plant matter and manure, whether it's human manure or animal manure. This stuff was clogging up waste streams, was creating all these problems, but working class people said, hey, this is a great resource, and started to use it for these tiny little urban farms. So 5,000 farmers um, worked in Paris in circa 1900, and they grew fruits and vegetables for two million Parisians with a surplus to ship to London. And they do that, did that usually, mostly powered by horse manure that they used to warm up the soils underneath um, their hotbeds and grow you know, spring crops in winter and um, summer crops in spring and push the season that way and grow year round. It was some of the most intensive and productive agriculture that we know of. Um, New York City, there are night soil workers. Night, that's a nice way of saying people who dealt in poop. And they cleaned out the outhouses in late 19th century New York, and they took the night soil across Long Island Sound to Long Island farmers who bought that great set of nutrients. And then they, these um, 
barges brought back fruits and vegetables from Long Island Sound to sell in New York City markets. And so you can see this exchange of nutrients continuing forever, the same nutrients, whether they're in the night soil or they're in the vegetables, going back and forth until the toilet revolution. And, and sanitation officials thought it was a great idea to take clean water, mix it with poop, and flush it into Long Island Sound and all the, the water surrounding Manhattan, which then quickly killed off the clams, the shellfish, the fish that were a, a fantastic source of food for people living in Manhattan. Um, so these are the kinds of stories I'm interested in. And, and this, this book goes to the present. I'm, I'm working with uh, some of the people in, the, in this audience um, on some um, projects in Amsterdam today and looking at how the revival of urban farming in, in cities like Amsterdam and in Boston where I live and Washington DC where I lived for 20 years has become a really vibrant part of urban living. And I think it can help us solve, be, you know, one component of solving both the problem with um, carbon emissions, the problems of, um, of nitrogen that we're thinking of in, this, in, in the Dutch um, situation, of water retention, of having healthy green spaces for people, and having healthy food for people to eat um, without a lot of packaging and long distance trucking and without a lot of emission of fossil fuels. Mm. Cool, nice. Um, you're talking about a revival of um, interest I suppose, in, in gardening or growing your own food. Is this something you recognize in your research and activities? Yeah, I, I think so a lot. Um, I started working on urban agriculture maybe 15 years ago. And by that time, the, the, the waiting list started to come in, uh, in allotment gardens. Whereas before, you know, it was very hard to find people to actually work on allotments. So this is really something that started to grow, although I think maybe a little bit of that hype has passed. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I think there's a lot more attention for growing your own food. And it's, it's gotten out a little bit out of that, um, yeah, how do we say that in Dutch? Like the gray, the, the woolly socks the or like, yeah. where it's like... <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. Explain that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where it's very alternative or like mm -hmm. not cool, basically. And I think it, it got out of that sphere a little bit where it's become more, you know, normal to talk about. You don't have to be ashamed if you have some, you know, if you grow some of your own food in your back garden or so. There's more attentions for um, these little gardens next to, the, to your houses. Where I live in Utrecht, you can actually have the municipality you know, install them for you. All you have to do is, is plan something in there. So I think it has really become something that has become nor more normal than 10, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, I think lots of people grow at least something, you know. It doesn't have to be immediately a lot or all of their food. We did some research in Almere where we asked the people um, how much or whether they do anything in terms of their own growing. And of our sample, of course, there's always some bias, but um, there were more than 800 people who filled out the questionnaire, and it was something like 75% did at least something. And it might be small, you know, having your own basil on the, mm -hmm. in the kitchen, which of course is tiny, and lots of people had only like one apple tree in the garden, but at least we something. Yeah, in Almere, lots of people have gardens, because it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite a wide city, so lots of people do actually have gardens. Um, but yeah, I think you see it more now. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe to mention, um, if you have any questions during the whole program, don't be shy. Raise your hand. There are people here walking around with microphones. Um, there are no stupid questions, uh, just so you know. Um, uh, thanks. Um, I was wondering, because the, the program is called Harvesting Care, so it's both about, I think, at least I think so, harvesting, well, taking care of each other as well as um, the greens around us or nature around us. Um, um, you are quite um, active already since what you've been in Amsterdam for two months uh, in an 
garden or a farm. A farm. Um, do you notice anything on, in terms of social cohesion uh, when digging uh, yeah. in the dirt? Yeah. So this is a farm. It's a community-supported agriculture. So people are members, and then they come and they pick their own food, and they pick on Thursdays and Fridays. And I work on Fridays, and. Um, it's a very different experience than going to Albert Hein and scanning your own products that are wrapped in plastic and then leaving very quickly, never talking to anyone. Um, I noticed there was about 120 members of the farm, and there's three full-time farmers, and then there's some volunteers. And I noticed when people come in and they see one of the full-time <laughs> farmers, um, one man said, you know, very emotionally, "My wife just had a baby." And and Edu responded, and they talked about this thing as this man was was picking his, his produce, that there's a sense of a, of a community among these people who are really only connected by the food that they eat. And so what, what creates that community? Um, and and over, people don't just pick up the food. There's a lot of discussion and conversation that goes on. And I was thinking about it. You know, our, our ancestors um, grew, grew their own food, you know, think centuries ago, grew their own food. And then they would take the taro root from the ground and they'd brush off most of the dirt, but not all of it. And then they would take a wooden bowl and they'd take a stone and they'd pound it in the wooden bowl and mush it up. And, and then they'd cook it and they'd make food and they'd put it in another bowl. And then they'd invite whoever their dinner guests were. And their dinner guests would all take their hands and they would eat their food. So what has just happened in that exchange? is that they've taken the microbes from the earth and the microbes from the wooden bowl and added to the minerals from the rock and the microbes from the other human hands and brought them all together and brought them down to the digestive tract of, of the humans. Um, we now know that the, the, the gut microbiome is um, a second brain. It, it has a lot to do with how we feel how well we think, how well we're um, adapted to our environments. So having shared all of that, both with our environments and with the people that we're eating with, we become synced up. We become better adapted. We form stronger communal bonds, not just emotionally, because I've served you food, but physically, because I've shared my microbial world with you which involves you know, microbes in the currents and microbes in the ground and in the tools that I use. Um, so this is a, a really important part of being human. And that doesn't happen when we go to Albert Hein and we get our food wrapped in plastic and we zap it into the microwave and then we eat it alone staring at some device. And I think that that alienation that we experience um, comes from a, a physical alienation with the worlds and the humans in which we live. Um, microbiologists um, understand that um, human gut diversity has dropped about in half if you compare people in the industrialized world with people who live in a so-called traditional lifestyle that I just described. And they th they're not sure what all that microbial diversity does, but they do understand that people tend to be healthier and happier who have greater microbial diversity. So by returning to um, the green spaces right in our midst, and by using the organic material that cities gather to them, we can start bringing back the bonds that I feel like we've lost in the last 70 years since the invention of things like plastics and, and um, uh, you know, agro-industries. It sounds quite intimate the way you describe it, how we share microbes when we share food. Um, do you have the idea that people um, experience it like that as well? That it's... I, I, I don't actually know, but I mean, that's what I guess I was trying to relay that, like working at the farm, that when people come in, there's a sense of community as everybody is, is sharing in this common basket of food that we produce from this um, soils in Amsterdam West. Um, we know that people are closer to each other microbially who live together 
than people who are blood relatives. And we've, in, we've invested, you know, in the 20th century history, 19th century history, we've invested so much energy into this genetics, right? And we just finished in the 1990s the human you know, genome project where we mapped human genetics. And what did we find out? Not a ton. We really overplayed genetics that our community is really very much a bond with our environments and the people and the other non-human, more than human species in our environments. In that sense, I'm curious, I mean, you're doing research. In, into the past. Into the past. Um, is there anything we can learn from um, the people from the past in the sense of how they built or um, Grew, grow, grew their food, uh, shared food. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think that the, these kinds of, um, but to me, what seems most pertinent right now are these kinds of. We don't need to go into the far past and reinvent agriculture from the 1600s. But I think that um, the working class people who created um, technology, specifically in cities, um, in the late 19th century and the early 20th century. Um, had a lot of things that we might be able to learn from today. Um, for instance, taking horse manure, burying it in trenches, putting topsoil over it and, and glass over that, and creating this heat you know, from, that heats up the soils from underneath, solar, captured solar sun from on top, and you can um, grow plants out of season really well and, in, and, and intensively. Um, then once you're done, you, you dig up that horse manure, it is composted and broken down, and you can use that as a fertilizer. You don't need to be using a lot of petroleum products to squeeze nitrogen out of the atmosphere to produce you know, chemical uh, fertilizer that we then spread all over the place. Yeah, I, I just wanted to react because I think there is also something um, people really enjoy knowing these things and knowing how to do things because, well... Lots, lots of us, uh, many of us just work behind a computer, right? And we don't really make anything with our hands anymore. And I think there is something comforting from making your own things. And even if it doesn't really even taste that good, yeah. it already tastes good because you made it yourself. Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to so many farmers who just explained, like, I can really taste that I grew this cabbage or I made this. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, really? in a blind experiment, would you really? But it doesn't matter, it's the whole experience around it. And they also said, you know, it would be so much cheaper and easier to just go and buy this, but it's just the fact that I made it that makes it so valuable. And also I think to share it because there's effort in there and people, we don't have a lot of time, but we put our time there and our effort and that makes it so valuable then. And then I think that's also what people enjoy doing just to spend time on making something with your own hands. Yeah. It's true. I mean, I have, I have a very, very tiny one square meter um, farm in my backyard. <laughs> um, and it's, it, I mean, it's such a joy to just grow something and then be able to serve one carrot at dinner and share it. <laughs> it's, it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And it tastes amazing, really. Um, um, are there any questions from the audience? I see someone in the back. Yes, so thank you. Um, I'm uh, from Almere. I grew up there and uh, I know there are a lot of gardens where I know that these are full of stone. Um, uh, my question was more about um, b an individual garden because you talked about the garden as a communal place and I was thinking uh, the question is, is an individual garden or is it a necessity to, be, to have a communal garden um, and can the individual garden be uh, a problem with uh, to be sustainable? No, I don't think so. I don't know how you feel about it. No, I, I think it, j it just leads to something else. Like you won't get social cohesion on an individual garden necessarily, maybe with other gardeners, but... But then you can bring your food to a potluck. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah. I have a garden when I'm back home in Boston, and I grow, you know, about eight months of the year, I grow most of the food, that the, pro the fresh food that we eat, I, I grow in that garden. And um, I'm very proud of it, and, and I love to have people come over and eat it. <laughs> I, do, I did find in my own research that there's a difference. Um, I studied uh, one uh, allotment in Almere, um, and people there were, I mean, social cohesion did grow, and people really uh, enjoyed the time on the garden. Sometimes they'd been there for 30 years, which is, especially for Almere, very long. Um, but that's a different kind of atmosphere than I, I also studied some gardens where people actually got together because they wanted to improve the neighborhood and create like a neighborhood project. So in these neighborhood projects, it's really not so much about the vegetables. It's more about coming together to do something. So I think that is a different output. Also much less about the vegetables in the end. Yeah. I saw another hand. Yeah, a few. Hello. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, I have a question for the panel, but particularly for Kate. Um, historically, do you see class dynamics playing into the creation and tendering of individual gardens, and which I'm sure you do, um, but do you see that in the present day as well? Because what we're discussing here of having the physical space in one's residence to have a garden, the initiative to do it, the time to do it, um, these all seem like very middle class luxuries that perhaps working class individuals might not have the time or the, or the energy um, to do. Yeah, thanks, Justin. Um, in the past, these were mostly working class people involved in these projects. Um, and they would do it, like, like for instance, take Berlin, for instance. Um, you know, there's all these working class people that are living in these crowded tenements. The tenements are a sanitation nightmare. And they would just went to the edge of the city and started guerrilla gardening wild gardening, it was called at the time. And the police chased them off, the police chased them off, but that so many people came that they finally just said, well, it's better than them drinking in pubs. And they let people create these sort of allotment gardens. And people made you know, arrangements with the, the, you know, whoever owned the land. And they created these, what are called Kleingarten in German. And, and if you go to Berlin, there are so many, 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 many acres of these allotment gardens that continue to this day. Um, and so you're associating um, gardens with the middle class. But like, for instance, in the United States, um, lots of you know, in historically black neighborhoods, people came from the sharecropping south. And they, 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 bought, they built a little tiny, they got a lot. They built a little tiny house. They got as much. They got a couple of lots. And they started gardening. And that's how they, you know, they were the first to be fired and the last to be hired. And that's how they kept themselves going. Those gardens tided them over during the times when they are out of work. And we find, as we look at these historically black neighborhoods that have space like that, that those neighborhoods were financially solvent, that people own their own houses at much higher rates than white working class or even upper class Americans at the same time in the you know, 20s, 30s, and 40s. So the question is, what happened? In the United States, um, the lawn became the law of the land. And, and, and in, literally, like municipality after municipality took the same language and said, you need to grow plants that are no taller than six inches unless they're ornamental. Now, these are really vague laws. And so they were selectively enforced. And what we found when we mapped it is that they started enforcing these laws in neighborhoods after they passed, the, they struck down the, um, the ability to discriminate based on um, race, skin color, and ethnicity in the United States after 1964 and the Fair Housing Act, you see these laws emerge, and they're used to keep um, people of color out of white neighborhoods. So we think of plants as apolitical, as innocent little things, but they're quite political. And they can be, they can be charged with all kinds of causes. And that's why we have the lawn. The third largest crop after corn and soybeans in the United States is turf grass. It's a crop that nobody can eat. It's actually environmentally detrimental. Um, water rolls right off of it. Um, and, and they pour over a lot of pesticides and fertilizers to keep that stuff going. There's no reason to have lawns other than for one reason is to maintain structural racism. Is this something? you recognize here in the Netherlands? Or how is it class-wise? I mean, you yeah. were just saying that the geitenwolle sokken... Uh, I didn't think gone. about this, but I, I do know that in the Netherlands, 
I think lots of municipalities, when they, when they think about support for urban agriculture, they always say it should come from the people, which I always think is a little bit unfair because there's people in certain neighborhoods who know much better how to get this going, who to talk to in the municipality. And there's other neighborhoods where people might actually enjoy a communal garden project, but they have a lot of other stuff on their mind, right? And I feel it's a bit unfair to then... May, they may not know the, the, the ways to, to get the money. I mean, some of these gardens are heavily financially supported. They may not know the ways to get, you know, to get that money. And they may also be dealing with lots of other stuff so that maybe the garden should just be there for them to join rather than for them to set up. Mm -hmm. um, so I do feel in that sense it's more middle class or upper class um, projects. Mm. That said, I've spoken to so many different types of people in gardens, so um, it, it is something that, is, that, that crosses all these classes. Um, but yeah, some people just know better the ways to get the money from the municipality. I saw a few more hands, so maybe one more question now and then we continue. Yeah. Um, thanks so much for this really interesting conversation. I wanted to kind of follow up um, on something that I think where Kate was going to go, where I wanted her to go. Um, at the very beginning, um, I think you, you both were kind of portraying a very wholesome picture of, you know, urban farming. And I wanted you to talk a little bit more about what could be the dark underbelly of, of this. I'm not sure if it's any, anywhere from sharing my growth that are not so good on a more kind of practical level to any kind of other negative side effects that you've seen. I, I can tell you're very good at storytelling. So I was wondering if you had some stories that kind of illustrate also kind of the dark, the dark underbelly of, of urban farming. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So say we were going to um, try to you know, take a, a, a big city, many parts of the world, and, and use it to produce the bulk of fresh produce that people consume in that city. The problem we have is that we've trashed our landscapes. And we've, um, you know, the American cities, um, Dutch cities, are filled with what we call brownfields in the United States. These are areas where there was a factory or there was some dry cleaning or uh, an auto shop, and the land is contaminated. Um, in the United States, there was a practice of taking um, the thing that comes out of the, the um, municipal waste streams, you know, so you know, human uh, waste, but also everything else that everybody dumps in the, in the, down the sewers, which includes industrial um, chemicals and waste. We only checked for um, pathogens, for bacterial pathogens, not for any chemical waste. And they dump that on, um, you know, they give that to schoolyards, they give that to farmers. And now we realize that they're filled with forever chemicals and we've you know, contaminated this territory. So, so that's the real problem. Right now there's a, a, a controversy um, in the Amsterdam South where there's a, a 42 hectare uh, plot of land that used to be an organic farm, it was an organic farm for 50 years, so that means the soil's good, it's clean. Um, but the city wants to turn that into, pave it over and turn it into a logistics center. You know, trucks coming and trucks going. Um, there's lots of places that are already contaminated. It would be great to do that in Amsterdam. I'm sure you could find lots of brownfields for that. But they want to take this place because it's between the highway and the airport, and you know, it would be great. Um, so, that, so there's some activists, some of them in this room, that want to turn that into a food park, food soul park. And that makes much more sense. Um, and one of the things they're thinking about as they do that is, you know, so you... So you say you start an urban farm and you get a, a 10 year or five year lease on that land and you turn it into something beautiful and productive. You, you, as a farmer, you can't afford to buy urban land. You can't barely afford to lease it. And so as soon as you turn into something that's, you know, you regenerate land and you turn it into something beautiful, then in comes a developer. In comes somebody who wants to turn that into a beautiful gated community for wealthy people. And so that's one of the things that you start to see is people start to focus on land use issues. That this land needs to be taken out of, out of capitalism, out of markets, and held in trusts so that people can grow food on it. And, and, and 
you know, we just saw the guy, um, what's his name, Ivan Shabard, the, the head of, the founder of Patagonia, who just took the whole Patagonia and took that company and, and moved it into a trust. And a big part of that trust is to buy land that will forever be held in a trust that can't be sold on capitalist markets. And I think this is the way that capitalism is going to be undermined, finally, is that sideways movement of, of little parcels of land getting moved out of markets and into, these, into the commons. And, and we know from European history that once you know, people got started getting pushed out of the commons and the commons became enclosed, that was the rise of capitalism because that gave you know, few individuals controls of large tra tracts of land and then all these other people didn't have anything and, he, and they no longer had a way to self-provision, so they had to go work for the man in the factory or at the manor house. So shifting away from that, so now we get to land use issues and reinterpreting the, you know, what we, what, what, how we consider land, that it's no longer something to be owned and possessed, but it's a commons to be shared, not just among humans, but among all the species that share that land. And then we sort of start to think about biodiversity in new ways. That was a long answer, sorry. There is one, uh, someone here with a beautiful uh, gray scarf. Okay, you. you <laughs> just so we know that you are the. I, I saw your hand a few times. So, um, one final question before we move to the um, next part of the. Program. First of all, Kate, welcome in Amsterdam. Thank you. you are very, very needed, especially for our project, Futsal Park Amsterdam. And um, um, I didn't know, uh, by the way, that uh, our project is uh, a celebrity uh, project. Well, worldwide now, so <laughs> we, we've done a good job, I guess. Uh, but a question. Um, you elaborated already on, on, on uh, the question I want to raise. Uh, it's about if we have uh, a second brain, maybe our second brain isn't so intelligent because when soil is keeping us happy, and is uh, connecting us with uh, the community. Uh, where did it go wrong? Where did it go wrong? And when did it go wrong? Because, and, and shouldn't it be uh, in the title harvesting crisis in, instead of care? Because uh, we do see in the history of uh, human uh, uh, development that whenever there is a crisis, we manage to grow our own food in Second World War, uh, the story of the British women who took up the, 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 the labor of, of, of the field workers is a, is a great example how it works. So what, what, what can we do to bring that uh, resource back in, in, in our society? Yeah, and, you know, and think about the collapse of the Soviet Union. They had allotment gardens you know, belting every Soviet city. And, and suddenly, Soviet agriculture collapsed with the state. Half of the food was produced. They, they didn't do a great job before the collapse of feeding, of getting food in the stores. So people just went out to those gardens. They created massive new ones in the 1990s. And 90% of the food people ate in the Soviet Union and in places like Cuba came from these little tiny gardens where people you know, farmed intensively in little tiny gardens. So it's, it's possible. It's, it's possible in Amsterdam. Amsterdam actually is a very green city. And um, you take the nutrients that Amsterdam is now throwing into landfills, and you compost them and put them on soils. And, and you could grow a great deal of food in this very mild and increasingly mild climate mm -hmm. with lots mm -hmm. of water to, um, to boot. Mm -hmm. um, so where did we go wrong? I, you know, I, I mean, uh, historians and geologists keep coming back to 1951. That's the date that we're starting to think is the beginning of the Anthropocene. That's the, the new epoch in which humans are now the driving planetary force. And um, so what happened in 1951 is a lot of things. Um, and, and we could go on and on. But, but the Green Revolution was, was one that's most pertinent to this conversation in which um, new hybrid plants were developed to, that had greatly increased yields 
and they you know like doubled and tripled the amount of food that we could be grown on one acre of land but to do that you needed sort of laboratory conditions. You needed a lot of uh, sun and water and fertilizer and a lot of pesticides to kill the bugs for these really vulnerable monocrop plants. And so that got us off into this agro-industrial um, revolution. Um, eventually, they grew so much food that like, we don't even need all this food. Let's feed it to the animals. And so by the 1980s, a lot of this, this you know, soybeans and corn and, and grain is being fed to animals, four-fifths of the food grown in the Netherlands today goes to animals, not to humans. So when the farmers put up signs that say, no farmers, no food, they're not exactly telling you the whole story. Of course, eating meat, like that's so that so humans could eat meat, meat eat, eat meat a, a lot every day, many times a day. But of course, eating meat is the least efficient form of food. So these humans tottering at the top of the food chain are really in this precarious situation. So we need to, um, you know, we're talking about switching to you know, uh, vegetable proteins from animal proteins and, and changing a lot of things. And I, I, I'm, I fear that what's going to get us to grow our own food again is the new crisis. And the new crisis is speeding our way in the form of climate change. Not so hopeful. I'm back to doomsday, aren't I? <laughs> um, we're going to have some time to reflect on this, um, as Anna Koy is going to read a short, or not short, column. Um, we head down. Thank you, Esther. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, say, um, I'll give Anna a few a short introduction. I don't know what you prefer. If you want to stay behind the lectern. Uh, or stand behind the lectern, or, yeah? Um, Anako is about to enter the stage. She is a, <laughs> she is a food sociologist, a socially engaged chef. Um, her work interconnects food studies with food work um, in its myriad manifestations, ranging from, ranging from anti-food waste activism, gastronomy, participatory art to installation and performance. And since 2019, she's been super busy because she's been part of both Casco Land, uh, the Collaboratory Kitchen, Slow Food Network, uh, Food Council MRA, and Taste Before You Waste. And in between all those things, she's also studying um, because she's following a preparatory PhD trajectory it's a mouthful, in uh, ru rural sociology. And she's also doing an MA in philosophy here in Amsterdam. So this is one busy woman. Um, here you go. Well, what an, what an announcement. I hope I can live up to the expectations. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, I was invited here today uh, to write a short column in which I bridge today's two main topics of urban farming and care uh, in 10 minutes. Not an easy task, uh, but I decided to give it a bold try, so bear with me. As a food sociologist and chef, uh, one of Kate's research questions speaks to me in particular. How did people feed themselves before industrial agriculture? Or, in other words, if I may take the liberty to reformulate, what can we learn from pre-industrial knowledge when it comes to our food system? In fact, Kate invites us to look over our collective shoulder. Imagine a world before the industrial revolutions, which for many of us is already hard enough to do, and learn from our ancestors. Now that climate change is no longer a threatening sort of Damocles hanging over our planet, but has become an undeniable reality in many parts of the world, perhaps we will finally let go of the once so shiny narrative of unlimited growth and turn to our ancestors with humility. When reimagining our food system, which kinds of knowledge have we been overlooking? What have we disregarded, dismissed, muted, the answer is a lot. As post-colonial anthropologist Arturo Escobar 
brilliantly pointed out in his work on political ontology, the neoliberalizing, globalizing, one-world project, as he calls it, has eroded our ability to perceive ways of knowing that diverge from the dominant ideology of capitalism. As a result, the world as a place governed by individuals and markets seems to be just the way that things are. This is why we need critical thinkers and artists to spark imagination, to slow down and be humble. As Boaventura de Sousa Santos, in line with Escobar's thinking, wrote, we must recognize the rich diversity of knowledge that exists outside of the monocultural realm of capitalist thinking. Rather than turning to high-tech solutions, which often come in an unpleasant one-package deal with corporate monopolized knowledge, now might be the time to recognize the importance of knowledge that is passed down informally, from generation to generation, through an intricate web of social relationships. When we talk about this informal knowledge, or know-how, if you will, the garden and the kitchen, as universal meeting places, have been key sites for the production of this historically marginalized knowledge. I argue that it is here that we might find some answers to the urgent questions of our time, such as how can we grow food in and around our city? How can we relearn to eat in tandem with the natural rhythms of the seasons? How can we adjust our diet to times of scarcity and abundance? Which also implies how can we learn to preserve food again, to preserve harvests again, like our grandparents did. Ironically, in a time of increasing xenophobia, this knowledge still seems vibrant and alive among immigrant communities. For the past years, I've been working with Kaskoland, a community art project in Amsterdam New West that has transformed a former parking lot into an urban orchard and communal kitchen. Here, I worked on building a biocultural archive of food preservation techniques that exist in the neighborhood, using food waste as ingredients. This meant long days of cooking with local residents, most of whom are first and second generation immigrants. One day, I remember we were working with bell peppers. To my surprise, instead of being thrown away thoughtlessly, all bell pepper seeds were carefully removed, cleaned and kept by my Turkish neighbors for their own vegetable cultivation. While I myself participated in several workshops to learn about foraging or uh, collecting edible plants from public spaces, these women flawlessly identify delicious weeds and fruit trees on the streets. Seeing the city as an edible landscape is something I learned from them. So where did we go wrong? This question was already asked before. Let's take a step back. As Karl Marx captured in his alienation theory, the Industrial Revolution has alienated us from our human nature, from the ways in which very basic necessities for our human existence are produced. One could easily argue that food is the most basic necessity of all. As a person who was born and raised in Amsterdam, as a child, I was pretty much completely unaware of the way in which my food arrived to my plate. I think it's safe to say that thanks to our collective dependence on the supermarket, most urban dwellers frankly have no clue about the processes that take place prior to the clean and bright aisles packed with plastic wrapped food, which for the record, explain farmers mockery of urban dwellers. Our collective alienation from food production has caused us to lose knowledge and thus agency over our food. And that's exactly why urban farms are vital. They reintroduce the rural in the urban. They remind us of the messy processes that are involved in food production, thus automatically reconnecting us to nature. Urban farms are places where we encounter natural processes of grow and decay, sow and harvest, birth and slaughter. Now that even the remotest places of our planet have been modified by humanity, does nature even still exist? I argue that it does. But in order to truly grasp the importance of urban farms as natural places, we must let go of the no notion of nature as wilderness. The perceived dichotomy between nature conservation and food production that dominates environmental policy making today is based on a dualist and romantic notion of nature as a pristine wilderness, untouched by human hands, rather 
than as an ecosystem in which humans and the production of their food can have an integral and even beneficial role. Farming doesn't necessarily have to be a fight against nature, like it has been in industrial agriculture. This becomes clear immediately if we consider non-Western agricultural systems, such as the milpa, a food forest garden uh, that generates the growth of seemingly pristine rainforest in Latin America. But let's go back to Amsterdam. Because urban farms are places not only where we might encounter nature, but also each other. In times of increasing socio-economic inequality and polarization, informal spaces where we meet each other are crucial. Through farming, cooking and eating together, we establish long-term relationships that foster reciprocity, trust and mutual respect, which can serve as an antidote for capitalist relationships that are based on competition. We, as human beings, are social creatures who exist in a web of social relationships. Especially now that we spend an average of seven hours behind screens, urban farms might help us to become social creatures again through commoning. Commoning, I uh, use Silke Helfrich's uh, definition here, as the creation and maintenance of relationships while acknowledging our interpersonal connections and interdependencies. The fact that I use it here, commoning, as a verb, is not a coincidence. Commons cannot exist without commoning. It is through shared work, such as tending our crops or cooking our meals, that we forge bonds. These two, farming and cooking, are both universal human activities that are moreover strongly related to our sense of belonging and identity. It's as simple as that, perhaps. We must get out of our offices, break free from the screen spell and get busy in the fields or the kitchen, or both. This directly ties into the way in which we organize care as a society. But what kind of care are we talking about here? It is ironic that our heavily understaffed, overloaded and expensive care system in the Netherlands is in desperate need of care itself. After decades of an austere neoliberal logic that undermines social solidarity and reduces citizens to consumers who buy, rather than give and receive care, we seem to have forgotten about the importance of social ties. Care takes place on micro skills and often happens informally. This became crystal clear when the corona pandemic unraveled. As countries went into lockdown, cities turned into ghost towns and public spaces such as parks became no-go zones, daily social encounters became rare. Suddenly it became clear how much we rely on the invisible web of relationships and the care that happens through them. In formal care, we can define it as uh, unpaid care provided by family, close relatives, friends and neighbors. In Europe, an estimated of 80% of all the long-term care is provided by informal caregivers. Moreover, on average, European informal caregivers clearly outnumber formal caregivers and generate a significant indirect and often largely invisible economic contribution that ranges from 40 to 90% of the overall costs of long-term care. However, when combined with our 9 to 5 jobs, informal care often proves to be a significant strain on those providing the care, especially on the long run. The question then is, how do we combine work with care? I propose here that urban farms can be micro-realities, laboratories, cracks in the capitalist system, where food production has the potential to incubate new ways of caring for each other. One of the current social trends that I find personally most upsetting is the increasing apathy among people of my generation who dismiss their youthful idealism as naivete who no longer believe that things can truly change, who quit following the news, who get slowly but surely submerged in individualist hedonism. As citizens, we must resist the seductive force of nihilist consumerism. It's time we start caring again. About where our food comes from, who grew it, what it tastes like, and why not differently. Care is contagious. Once you regain autonomy over the production of your food, your fuel, the base for your existence, you inevitably come to care about the people who grew it. To illustrate my point, I would like to finish uh, with a quote from one of my favorite writers, Audre Lorde. Uh, she writes, 
during World War II, we bought sealed plastic packets of white, uncolored margarine with a tiny, intense pellet of yellow coloring just inside the clear skin of the bag. We would leave the margarine out for a while to soften, and then we would pinch the little pellet to break it inside the bag, releasing the rich yellowness into the soft, pale mass of margarine. Then, taking it carefully between our fingers, we would knead it gently back and forth, over and over, until the color had spread throughout the whole pound of bag of margarine, thoroughly coloring it." End quote. So you might have guessed it. My point is, we need to start kneading. <laughs> Perhaps if we roll up our sleeves and get involved in the work that happens at urban farms, we might re-embed ourselves in a social web in which the rich yellowness of care can be spread. Thank you. Anna, that was yeah, yeah. Thank you, Anna. That was really powerful and encompassing. I, I guess we can say. Um, joining us next, and I think you touch upon lots of uh, points that we can discuss even further now. Is Ruben Jakel, who is a sociologist, a writer, a lecturer at the Utrecht University of the Arts. He is a columnist for Brainwash and he presents or presented the podcast The Groene Eeuw. I don't know if there <laughs> are any uh, new um, episodes coming. Uh, and he wrote a book recently, a year ago, it's on the table here, called The Eeuw van Felix or Felix's Century, um, in which he explores the ways in which we can ensure a livable uh, or habitable planet for future uh, generations. I read your book and it's quite hopeful. And I was wondering, um, <laughs> how come? <laughs> well, well, it's inter interesting you, you said that because I have different uh, reading experiences from people. Um, I, actually, the, whole, the book was a whole struggle for me to... Uh, define what I think is hope because I'm not that optimistic about the future mm. and, uh, but there was this intuition that I thought hope must be something else than just being optimistic mm. and then I read this uh, well I went doing all kinds of stuff and, and uh, um, found out hopeful places, but there was this quote from Václav Havel, uh, was a Czech uh, prime minister um, for 13 years, he was also a dissident in communi uh, communist Czechoslovakia, and he wrote something very beautiful about hope, he said that, that, that yeah, hope is not um, the same as being optimistic or uh, having the assurance that things will be okay, but it's more like a state of mind, it's a kind of... Um, it is the assurance that you think what is what you are doing or what you are occupied in is worth doing without the assurance of the result and that the activity itself can be hopeful and and that is not kind of an end result mm. and for me that was the most workable way to think about opti yeah hope that that yeah being active being in the garden being occupied with cooperatives or being activists is kind of making me hopeful just by doing it. And um, I have no assurance that uh, we'll be, uh, Felix Sancho will be, will be fine, you know? So, but it's great to hear that you thought it was a hopeful book. Yeah, well, I like the idea of hope as a state of mind. But yeah. Yeah, that's good to keep in mind. Um, um, I mean, um, in the book you touch upon a lot of uh, subjects or, or topics, and one topic that was touched upon today a few times already was um, commoning or the commons, uh, which you also write about in, in your book. Connecting that to today's talk, um, how do you think commoning or the commons might help when it comes to farming, local initiatives, 
Uh, well, I think already many things have been touched, and uh, I think especially also the the part of uh, of, of land and and ownership yeah, and and trying to get something out of the market and also to give people the opportunity to buy in in a certain way. We have now several uh, initiative in Netherlands. Uh, the Land van Ons is an initiative which is uh, making citizens, giving them the possibility to invest in a land and then to collect the money to eventually buy the piece of land and to make it accessible for uh, yeah, regenerative agricultural practices. Um, and I think you have many of those initiatives in, in larger and smaller scale. Um, but I think especially the level on which you operate, this kind of local um, civil society level, is making it quite accessible for a general public. Because the other option is you try to change your individual life to be sustainable. Huh? That's like mm -hmm. the, uh, be neoliberal option. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. something like that. I think it, it is it's something worth doing. That's not, it's not that we shouldn't do that. But uh, and then the other hand, you have to go on the streets or something, or you have to be an activist, ex being part of Extinction Rebellion, uh, something like that. And I think for many people, um, that's a, maybe a too radical option. Um, but on this local uh, regional level being occupied with something like agricultural practices being something more than just a consumer but also being a producer on, on a slightly scale that that's for me also a very important part is that I, I am a part of my yeah my generation I've, I, I grew up like a consumer um, not much doing uh, you already mentioned this I'm not a producer in many ways but it's kind of a, yeah, it's an alienation of nature, from nature, but also from what makes you human is that you can produce, in a sense, also stuff. And that, I think that's a really um, uh, attractive element of, of the commons, that it, it makes people, it gives them the opportunity um, to also produce together uh, a more viable, more sustainable, more communal future. So. And, and do you think, I mean, this, I can imagine you can both answer to this, but do you think that this can eventually sort of overcome our whole um, industrial, agro revolution life that we are now in? Or is this too hopeful? <laughs> well, I'm not sure, but uh, I do think that. You could say you have the state, you have the market, and you have the commons in the sense that it, 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 in a perfect world it might keep itself in balance. And now there, we in the last couple of decades, we just had the market. And before that we had a big state and then we had a big market. And um, so I would be already very um, delighted to see that the commons will be just a very important player mm. in that field. In order to balance it out, yeah. so to say. Yeah. How do you feel about this, Kate? Well, I think, I mean, if we think about it, the commons are already quite prolific and very strong. Like I'm looking outside, and I'm seeing all these bikes parked, and if I went a little bit farther, I would see a whole big car park. Um, those are commons. Those are spaces we check in, we use them temporarily, and we check out. They're, they're, but they're available. They're publicly available space for all of us. So. So like, again, on the municipal level, this doesn't have to be an act of God, it doesn't have to be an act of state, but what if we just changed municipal coding in our communities? Every time, like in an American city, every time you build an, a, a condo and it has two bedrooms, you need to have two parking spaces. But what if you just change the law and every time you build a, a condo and it has two bedrooms, you need two garden allotment spaces? All of a sudden, the, the landscape around us begins to change dramatically. Uh, we're not going to need all of those roads out there. And if you go to an American city, you see like really impressive roads, 18 lanes maybe, one way. Uh, we're not going to need those. We're not going to be traveling that way. So these are common spaces that can be repurposed. And there are, th these roads tend to circle you know, cities. These roads tend to be right here with us. Amsterdam, I, I feel like when I'm in Amsterdam, I'm usually within like three minutes of some big old highway. You know, that's 
circling this city. That, that these spaces, I think, we already have an accepted practice that there are public spaces for common use, but what we need to do is change the use. And the use um, will sort of unplug from the fossil fuel basis that we've centered our societies, especially our cities around, and, and turn them into a, a space where um, we productively grow the resources, the, the nutrients that we need. Um, we have lots of labor in cities. We have, you know, where I volunteer, um, we're growing food for middle class Amsterdamers, but a lot of us work for free. And the farmers, um, there's three full-time farmers, and they work, they get less than minimum wage for their delivering food to people who drive up in really nice cars. So, so why is that? In, in part because another form of commons are, are, are federal subsidies. And big federal subsidies go to industrial farming. In the Netherlands, you have to have a farm that's larger than six uh, hectare to, to qualify. So if you have a small farm where I work, it's like a, it's about one and a half, you don't qualify. But why not change that law? That seems to make sense. And then, then clean, organic, local food would not become something that's coded as elite. The only reason it's coded as elite is because it's expensive. The only reason it's expensive is it's not subsidized. All the other food is subsidized. So we just level the playing field. And all of a sudden, we have a whole new understanding of what is good food and what's affordable food. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, that's interesting. Especially also, my question I have is that, yeah, how can we, is it already happening maybe? How can we make, um, how we convince politicians that they can enforce, they can sim stimulate these commons? That, that, that there might be a task for them, also a way of regaining trust among citizens um, by just not being the classical maybe um, verzorgingstaat, as we say it in, in the Netherlands. What does that mean? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's welfare the welfare state, state which was mm -hmm. quite top-down driven. Yeah. And uh, there's still, I think, very, uh, um, um, how would you say, reluctance to keep, 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 uh, give trust to bottom-up initiatives, uh, common, common driven initiatives, because politicians uh, don't really know how it will Turn out. work out, turn out. Um, but yeah, do you have any ideas on how politicians, or do you already see them coming up, which think, oh, these commons, they, they, they might be interesting for me as a politician <laughs> also to just to, to stimulate that? I stimulate fear not. Oh. No, I fear not. I think, um, as one activist was saying to me last weekend, the politicians aren't very powerful that behind the politicians are developers and, and financial interests, and, and, and they're, they're calling the shots. Mm -hmm. um, so you have this situation, uh, again, in, in the Futsal Park, where um, you know, the, the city politicians and the um, airport Chipotle, you know, yeah. interests are Lobbyist. working to, to pave over this territory. They have the bulldozers out there. They're busy doing it right now. Um, despite 8,000 people signing petitions, 750 people showing up for protests, um, ongoing protests for six years, and no customer for this logistics center. But still, it seems to be um, uh, like a ball rolling that can't be stopped. Oh. It seems oh. also a little bit like a mutual distrust then, right? Um, both politicians don't trust us, citizens, and we don't trust our politicians yeah. anymore. Yeah. How do we fix that problem? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe <laughs> not for today. Let's, let's go to the audience. <laughs> I was wondering, uh, you as a sociologist, um, yeah. I'm very curious what, the, what your analysis is about um, the situation we are in, because at the core, it's 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 about how we relate to each other. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's a bit. It's, it's a big question, of course, because it, it it has so many elements to it. But if if you could yeah, narrow it down to to this specific uh, topic, of course, power is is one like 
element in it there. Just a, it's a big power play, and there are very powerful um, players in this field, lobbyists of these industries, which are quite connected to to local politicians. Of of course, not all politicians of all parties. There are differences between the parties, and but some parties are not uh, behind the, the steering wheel, and and others are. So. Um, I think eventually, historically, you could say that eventually these changes always come up from from bottom up, from a, a big enough of group of people making as loud as possible that they want change on a specific topic. Um, but yeah, maybe that big that group isn't big enough yet, or um, maybe people do not still see that they could have this power if they organize themselves on a on a very effective way. And and I think in the past we have seen that this can happen. Yeah. Um, but maybe the crisis is not deep deep yet. No. Yeah, so people uh, are still I, I, very comfortable in their lives, or at least a big enough of a group, yeah. which might get uh, susceptible for this kind of uh, forms of activism or civilian activism if they come into certain... Um, areas in which they their livelihoods are more uh, um, in danger, yeah. and we might get there quite soon. So, there might be some options there. Yeah. I hope at least. Yeah, I, I share with you the the um, the idea that um, hope is a, a very powerful um, uh, thing to to uh, to have. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be um, also optimistic. In contrary, mm -hmm. if I look at uh, our, uh, the history of our own species, we can see that the, the way we learn is by, um, by, by pain and by crisis. So maybe we should um, uh, speed up uh, our climate crisis uh, in order to change, uh, really change no, 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 things, no, no, no. and yeah, yeah, well, it, that that's not uh, a joke. No, no, I, 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 I really, I, I get your point. I, I, I have several uh, similar thoughts on that. Uh, especially this summer, I thought uh, I really wanted to, to, to have the rain. You know, I was dying for it. And at the same time, I thought, well, maybe it should just go on for a while, a, li a little bit longer, uh, because. You, you yeah. till the, till so far we always got to the point that it was a crisis, and eventually we just made it through, and then it was quiet for a while. And then you get to another one, and then um, you ne never get to that critical moment in which people really feel okay. We have to stand up. We have to do something, and and we have to maybe uh, look around what's already there because there are uh, all these people who are working. All the the food park Amsterdam. This is if it won't work. It, it's not for nothing. It's it, there is a whole community built around that, and an infrastructure, and um, and and if the crisis gets deepened, then that might be useful uh, at a certain point. All these initiatives, all these pioneering, w w what has yeah. been done, we need that in at the moment. Yeah. The crisis is really. But mind you, we are doing this as a therapy. So when Footspark ended, we are lost. Yeah. For that specific yeah. battle, yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah, mm. but then maybe the crisis gets so deep, the economic crisis, that yeah. this whole economic endeavor yeah, of the logistics is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> might might be possible. Then there might be another a new opportunity. Yeah. You never know, of course. But uh, but uh, may I introduce an, another dimension in our discussion and. I think uh, our emphasis on, on, on uh, the things we are talking about um, is, is mainly uh, about knowledge. But is there n not something even more powerful than knowledge? Experience. And I'm, I'm thinking about values. Um, isn't it where our emphasis, uh, emphasis uh, should uh, lie on uh, building new and better values? Uh, yeah, well, I think for me, uh, if I look at my students, uh, we, we now go, at this point, we go now on a daily, uh, weekly basis, we go on an excursion. I just introduced this last year. I, thought I was talking about ecological civilization, ecological values a lot, but it felt a bit theoretical. 
a bit like abstract for those for most of the students as well. And then I thought maybe I should have to exper let them experience something which embodies these values. Just a place like a, uh, a garden might just embra uh, em uh, embody these values. And then they get very concrete. And for me, the experience that they have, that really makes a difference. Because I had so many students which were which are and still are, might be very alienated from nature in general. I had the students, with, we went to a, a farm last year, a regenerative farm in, uh, in Nijmegen, and this student came to me. She was from a third generation immigration, I think, uh, Turkish-Dutch, and she was very looking very angry to me. She had these really um, shiny shoes on. I, I, I told them, just get your <laughs> boots, but... She didn't listen. And then she was in the mud and, and, and it was a bit rainy. And then she said, I, I, I really don't like nature. <laughs> and she said that for a few times. But the funny thing was that she was, she was still interested. And she was asking quite interesting questions to the farmer. And, but at the same time, she said, but I don't have anything with nature. But she was still asking stuff. There was so, so there was some interest, I think. And then later, she wrote an essay. And then I found out that her mother who I think was a th second generation Im uh, immigrant. She had an allotment garden in Volkstown uh, where she came together with her friends, her female friends. And it was a place where they had conversations. They couldn't have anything uh, anywhere else. And then I found out that was, she was actually just reacting to her mother. <laughs> it's like, I'm an urban person. I'm not a... Yeah. Um, but I saw her slowly, like coming around, like, okay, maybe this is actually a really nice place where my mom goes to, where she can have free connection with her friends and talks, and they, they work in the garden. And then I thought, well, this, this could only happen by this experience that she was frustrated, that she was standing on a farm and she didn't really like it. I would never have probably get, got this reaction when uh, just talking about it in a, in a lecture. So I think that that is a really powerful thing and then in that sense gardens um, can really have that experience at, at least they have it to me as well um, so, uh. yeah. thank you any other questions I see a hand raised with another scarf lady Thanks for the wonderful talks. A uh, question mostly driven by curiosity. So have you, uh, do you know anything about how supermarkets or let's say the mainstream food producers uh, think about your initiative? Do you have contacts with them? Are there any partnerships or uh, struggles there just, just purely out of curiosity? Well, there, what was it? You guys from Food Soul Park can maybe r remind me, like 2019 there was, um, this rumor that there was a buyer for this logistics center out at Lukdemir Boulder, and um, but it wasn't clear who it was. The city was being secretive about it, and some of these activists found, went through the city records, and there was this contract. But all the the, the buyer, you know, the, you know, the person who was going to lease this, land, the party that was going to lease this land, was blacked out and redacted. Mm. They found one little thing down below, and it turns out it was going to be Albert Hines. And so then there was some, somebody in the city went and in one day, one morning, glued the door shut for eight different Albert Hein grocery stores. Couldn't open them. It took a couple hours to open them. And then just a couple weeks later, Albert Hein said, we don't want anything to do with <laughs> Look to your full folder. So yeah, it is, you want to say? Oh, there's a microphone Sorry. coming. Yep. They could make an extremely good uh, community garden for everybody and use it for their publicity and uh, blah, 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 if whatever. They kept it. Yeah, if they kept it. And they, they, they realized how good the soil is over there. It's the only soil in the area of Amsterdam without pesticides. It's extremely good. And the University of Wageningen, well, they, they did research and... Uh, so, yeah, they made a mistake. To, yeah. They, could, they the should time, talk with us. But at the same time, that, that action, illegal as it was, was effective yes. in, in yeah. turning the big grocery store chain to move to some, 
to think about someplace else. But I that think maybe this is bad publicity for us. We're, we're, we're sort of greenwashing our company. How do we do that when, when these, from these practices we're about to engage in are exposed? Um, touching upon this as well, because I know that I think maybe already 10 years ago, Albert Heijn did invest in, I think it's called Instock, so that's a restaurant that um, cooks food with sort of food that's not, that they can't sell in, mm -hmm. in shops anymore. Mm -hmm. So they, I think they're not completely sort of uh, against yeah. uh, new initiatives, but of course it's a question of, of greenwashing then. Um, we're almost out of time for this program, so I see one more question, and I think maybe this is the last one already, so you know. If you have more questions for our speakers, there are going to be drinks for the people here on site, not for you guys online. Um, so keep your questions um, and do raise them afterwards. But first. Hi, I'm, I'm Jackie, and maybe this is a good last question. Um, maybe hopeful, maybe positive. Uh, but a true question. So we had a toilet revolution, I find out, that made us change. So that was something good. Uh, so what innovation, what revolution in a positive way could maybe change, you know, allotments and food being uh, owned by commons be the new norm? Uh, reversing the toilet revolution be one way to do it. <laughs> Yeah. What a waste of great resources. Yeah. What a down shitty the, solution. A shitty yeah. solution. We yeah. Exactly. Um, Deal with your own shit. <laughs> exactly. I mean, literally, um, you know, China and uh, India are about to have their toilet revolutions, and there's not enough water in the world for these extra billions of people to flush toilet as luxuriously as we've, as we've been flushing toilets for the last 50, 60 years. And so, um, I mean, you know, at MIT, where I go, you know, they're real into high tech, big tech solutions, and they, they're also um, very confident about uh, giving advice to people all around the world. And so they, they'll go to Africa and they'll set up sort of dry bucket toilets for African villages. Um, but nobody would ever, but we have all kinds of um, towns in Alabama that, you know, have septic systems that are, are leaching all over the place and people are getting diseases. Bucket toilets would be great in these towns in Alabama. It would be affordable and it would be productive. But we can't even imagine that because we've talked ourselves into notions of progress and technology that really set us back. I, I think we need to, to, to open our understanding of what technologies are and what, um, what may, maybe something that looks retrograde or react, you know, or like so 18th century is something that we should possibly embrace. Now, even though it sounds medieval, Ruben. I just had to. Uh, the so funny thing is that I just had this lecture on Monday, and I talked about uh, this project called Broodje Poep. Mm -hmm. It's from a uh, designer, which which invented this. Yeah, she was. I was also like occupied with this topic, and she thought about. I need a, like a, a funny way to kind of put it on the agenda for people to just think about it. That yeah. But the opportunities are with our poo, also in combination with modern science, because we need it also to get uh, medicine uh, rests and stuff, uh, res residual out of it and stuff. So we do need some really high-tech um, solutions as well to get the poo ready to use for all kinds of purposes. But um, the thing is, as he went on to getting onto festivals with the bus and she gave, gave people the opportunity to leave their poo behind and they, they got an, a sandwich, <laughs> uh, which was actually um, using vegetables which were grown on human poo mm -hmm. before, a few uh, months before, uh, so she could use it during the festival season. And uh, I thought, yeah, well, we need that kind of stuff to really kind of let people see that, uh, yeah, we... We might could to learn something from the past and reuse it in the future. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, who would have thought we would end this talk talking about poo? Um, I did not. Um, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for being here today. 
Uh, our next NIAS talk is on the 17th of October, where we're talking about the history or the, the future of history. Um, for now, I think let's have a drink and, as mentioned, do tap, tap on their shoulders. Thank you all.